Well, Dave, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. This has been an area of uh, increasing interest, the, the, the private equity groups of which you, you represent one, mm -hmm. moving into ophthalmology. Um, and we're, we'll get into some details in, in a minute. We've written about uh, WAD Capital Partners partnering with Minnesota Eye. You've got a, uh, an enterprise as well that predates them, so you were technically first, I guess. But uh, I want to back up a bit. Sure. Because the comparison I keep hearing is, uh, is ophthalmology has many of the qualities that we've seen in dermatology. And dermatology has been really where you guys have been making some hay as of late. What is it about dermatology that made that an attractive space? And then we can kind of move over into ophthalmology. But what about ophthalmology that makes it as attractive space potentially as dermatology? Sure. Um, well, I get this question a lot. Um, obviously, we had, we had a very successful run in dermatology. I guess the similarity probably starts and ends with this. Dermatology was a play on essentially a supply-demand imbalance with respect to a growing skin cancer epidemic in this country and a very small provider base to treat that epidemic. There are, I think, real-time 16,000 licensed dermatologists to practice in this country. Um, we see coming, and we're experiencing it now, but we're really in the next 10 years, ophthalmology will experience something quite similar, which is the rise of chronic eye disease incidents, which correlates very much with age, and a relatively small workforce to treat it, which is 18,000 ophthalmologists. Now, um, those, are, um, th those are the similarities in secular trends. The other thing that people look at, and certainly we have as, as investors, is there is severe fragmentation of the provider base. Now, I'm not going to tell you that dermatology and ophthalmology are unique in that. Most provider realms uh, are deeply fragmented. That's just the nature of the U.S. healthcare economy. But um, when you look at the you know, 18,000 ophthalmologists in, this, in the U.S., and um, to my knowledge, I think our practice is probably one of, the, if not the largest in the country with you know, $150 million in revenue uh, in a $12 billion market. Um, that is sort of the definition of fragmentation. So those two things, strong supply-demand imbalance, which will drive good volume growth, good, good utilization growth, and then a consolidation rationale that we think is positive for the provider uh, and, and, uh, and, and ultimately the patient. That's, what, that's what's attractive. I, I, would, I never would have considered clinical demand as a, as a factor. I would assume that you're just looking for an inefficiency and you're going you're gonna to bring efficiency to an inefficient system or one that just needs to be consolidated. But you, in fact, see an in a system that could maybe benefit from consolidation while at the same time is, is going to be required to meet a growing clinical demand. Yeah. You know, your point's still well taken, which is there is inefficiency. I don't want to give us as private equity investors too much credit sure. um, that we're going to reinvent practices. Um, can we take central functions uh, and, and administer them centrally such that an independent practitioner who joins our practice can uh, basically create more time to see patients, we absolutely can do that. Can we build better as a big organization than we can as an, as an independent practitioner? We absolutely can do that. But that is not a specific to eye care. I mean, that's, that's sort of our thesis generally in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, it's really the secular trends that, that, that get us excited and the consolidation opportunity. Tell us a bit about your, your practice. Sure. Um, so Varsity is a uh, private equity fund um, specialized in, in healthcare services, clearly, but we actually have a very specific niche. Really, all we do is this. We acquire multi-location care providers, meaning functionally a group or a practice where a doctor or some licensed care professional is, a labor, is the labor force administering care to patients across multiple locations. I mean, that is really almost exclusively what Varsity does. We use our capital and our resources to acquire practices and groups when they're owned by the provider. So we're basically partnering with those providers. We're bringing in outside management where it's needed, um, putting some money behind infrastructure, typically revenue cycle and clinical workflow, a little bit of IT. And then we help the practice grow typically through a very accelerated acquisition strategy. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what my firm does. And we've done this uh, successfully in dermatology. Uh, I think we've had a really good run in ophthalmology. We have a good primary care practice. Uh, and there's lots of other verticals we're looking to do that in. But that's basically what Varsity does. What, what is the practice you have in ophthalmology? It's called ES, well, we refer to it as ESP, but it's known commercially as Eye Care Services Partners. And that is um, basically today a company that helps manage ophthalmology practices, uh, employees and, and our shareholders are the doctors themselves, centrally administering non-clinical functions. And today that business is 
roughly 60 locations nationwide, almost over almost 100 doctors, uh, and nearly 150 million in revenue. So it's one of the largest, if not the largest, essentially practice in the country. And it is an in integrated practice existing um, today in uh, seven markets across five states. So is it integrated in, in name only, or do they share a lot of back office yeah. services? Good question. It's actually integrated not in name at all. Um, you'll never see... Uh, I care services partners on anybody's business card other than the management Great team. Um, we actually believe very strongly in leaving the local brands in place that are part of our practice. But what they do share, and you made this point well, is, is the back office and infrastructure. So billing and compliance and recruiting, marketing, those are all administered by essentially a central company um, managed by a group of very professional managers who are not doctors. Uh, and it's obviously done at this point nationally. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how the practice works. And when I say integrated, I mean truly integrated. They, there is one EHR and EMR, EMR system that we are all on. Uh, we bill centrally, which really means regionally. We have two regional billing centers, um, but we don't have to leave that function locally. We'll do it as a we'll do it at corporate marketing. We give marketing support from corporate acquisitions, business development, all done by corporate reporting, compliance, all administered by corporate. That's what I mean. That's what our company does, and and uh, it's grown from um, kind of the early days of ESP was. Uh, a five clinic chain in Central Maryland called the Cats and I Group, which was a wonderful practice, um, to now a, 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 a national company. In industry like ophthalmology, where what we're what we're here at this conference to do is to talk about the the new technologies that are that are coming up. Those are obviously some of them are expensive. They're big ticket items that these practices have to buy. Is that another uh, benefit to having a deep pocketed? firm behind you to, to make those acquisitions a little more palatable? It is. Um, we can make investments. I mean, we as a company have a balance sheet and, and quite frankly, have the managerial talent mm -hmm. uh, and the IT DNA that typically doesn't exist within the, an, an independent practice. And I don't mean that disparagingly. Sure. Um, doctors are great at medicine, um, but asking them to be um, on the forefront of EHR and e, um, practice management technology, I think is asking a lot. Um, and so we have uh, a company that essentially can put money behind it and has the managerial talent to actually execute and deploy that technology in a way that we think would, sh should be accretive to an independent practitioner who joins our practice. Do you, a lot of, uh innovation that I've referenced earlier comes from the physicians themselves. And I think one concern that I've heard is that, and will probably come up on the conversation today, is that as these groups get larger, the ability to innovate will, will be hampered. Is that something that you discuss? Is that something you consider? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really important risk. Uh, it's also an opportunity. So um, I think the key to doing this well, meaning taking what are small, and dare, dare I say, um, professionals, meaning medical professionals who value their autonomy, specifically clinical autonomy, mm -hmm. um, and getting them to join a bigger organization and really get behind it, both as equity owners as well as great sponsors of the business in the community. How do you do that? Um, you have to engage them. So as a large organization, you have to listen to the doctors um, and, be, and be listening constantly as opposed to pushing new shiny new ideas down to the providers. We actually try not to get in the way of the way those providers are practicing medicine. The goal is not to take uh, a marginal physician and make him great just because he's part of our practice. Mm -hmm. The goal is really to acquire great physician and arm them with hopefully more sophisticated tools, maybe just different tools, but hopefully more sophisticated tools to practice medicine better uh, and to be more productive if that's their goal. But that's it. I mean, honestly, we, we really don't try to push clinical protocols down from corporate into a market where it may not be appropriate. Uh, we try not to take technology and tell it's tell uh, a doctor who's much more qualified to make the decision than us that that's going to be accretive to the patient's experience or their care program. We really try to stay out of that. Mm -hmm. What we're good at is running uh, and really managing practices. Um, that's our competency as a company. And I would guess that also goes along with physicians working with corporations on projects and clinical trials and things like that. That all. Supportive of all of it. I mean, that's the beauty of being a part of a larger entity is you can take that kind of innovation risk or put money behind clinical research in a way that might be harder uh, if it's all on your own dime as an independent practitioner. And as, an, as a large, um, relatively large, um, multi-market provider today, we have so many touch points with different patients and providers that puts our company in a really good position to be on the forefront of that innovation. Mm -hmm. And finally, how does, this, how does a story like this end. You're an investor with a timeline. Uh, where, where, what do these companies become 
and who ultimately owns them? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the reality is um, I don't have a grand vision, um, and, and we don't really put businesses together with the idea of trying to get someone specifically to buy them from mm -hmm. us. But what I would tell you is this, and I think the evidence um, that I'm here and that other private equity funds are now here at an ophthalmology conference should tell you, you have a very vibrant capital market in private equity. Um, so there will be medium and large private equity funds who can own uh, great ophthalmology practices when it's time for us to sell them. And what they'll do is just do what we're doing and probably do it better. They'll continue an acquisition strategy. They'll continue a really aggressive hiring strategy. They'll put more money into new initiatives like technology and clinical research. All we're doing is starting a little bit earlier. We start smaller. Our typical strike zone is a, when a practice is sort of five million of earnings and above. Um, and we will more than likely, the next owner will look just like us as a private equity fund. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I really don't have uh, a grand idea about what um, other than maybe th there's a good 20 years of consolidation ahead of us before we ever run out of real estate and we have to look at a, a market where there's some really large competitors and no room for anyone else. We're in no danger of that now. Excellent. Well, I hope we'll see you at many future OISs. Look forward to it.